Hi everyone, so welcome to this episode that is the first in a series which I call Austin Adaptation Autopsy and as it says on tin, it's pretty much me taking each Austin book, basically Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, Northanger Abbey, Emma, Persuasion, and um, oh my god, I ha Mansfield Park. Of course, how could I forget that one? The best Jane Austen novel ever. Ha <laughs> ha. Anyway, so I basically take each book, um, make an analysis of all the movies that were made about that book, and basically say which one was the most faithful to the book, which one was the best in my opinion, all the like. So obviously the series of adaptations I'm seeing today is for Pride and Prejudice, and because there are just so many adaptations for that novel, I had to split the Pride and Prejudice episode into two. So today, it's going to be the 1940 adaptation, as well as the two BBC miniseries, one that came out in 1980 and the other one that came out in 1995. So as I said before, Pride and Prejudice is the Jane Austen novel that got the most adaptations, and there are just so many that I had to cut out some. And I mean, already I had to split this podcast into two parts, and I'm kind of limited in time, so I had to make a choice somewhere. So because of that, I won't be talking about the Bridget Jones Diaries, mainly because while it is inspired from Pride and Prejudice, I don't really consider it an adaptation. I'm sorry about that. Well, the thing is, at the risk of sounding like a snob, I made the difference between inspiration and adaptation. Basically, I won't be talking about Lost in Austin either, since it isn't really an adaptation either. I kind of see it more as an affectionate parody of sorts. And I won't be talking about Pride and Prejudice and Zombies for obvious reasons. This said, girls in Regency dresses with swords is the most awesome thing I've ever seen. And I mean it. So, the reason why Pride and Prejudice is the novel that got the most adaptations is because it's the novel that aged the best, unlike Mansfield Park. And Pride and Prejudice is basically the grandmother of every rom-com ever, and rom-coms in general follow a pattern that's very similar to Pride and Prejudice's basic pattern, which is the following. So, first of all, first impressions, <laughs> crush bantering, misunderstanding and separation, making up, falling in love for reals, and living happily ever after. So, again, as I said before, for today's episode, I'll be reviewing the 1940 film, the 1980 and 1995 miniseries, and next episode will be the 2005 film, uh, the Bollywood version titled Bride and Bridget. Prejudice? Oh my god. Bride and Prejudice. Bride and Prejudice. Bride and Prejudice. Oh, not bad. And a modern day take, which is the Lizzie Bennet Diaries. Um, what I'll be focusing on is mostly how faithful the adaptations are to the novel or how they're different. I'm not really... Well, I am going to analyze the themes, but not as much as I should. Um, I won't be really giving a visual analysis, which would be very fitting for a 2005 film. It's for the simple and good reason that just a visual analysis for a 2005 film would be a podcast in itself. So, I'll be talking about it, but not as much as I would to, because the podcast would be just way too long. Starting in chronological order um, with the 1940 film, which was produced by MGM, directed by Robert Z. Leonard starring Greer Garson and Lawrence Oliver. Um, basically, for this version, in order to understand why certain changes to source material were brought, we need to understand the context in which the film was made. So it was the golden age of Hollywood, or old Hollywood, and when we hear old Hollywood, we can think of, you know, Vivian Lee, Cary Grant, Grace Kelly, Betty Davis, George Cukor, but... But for others, we'll also think of the Hays Code and studio restriction and, let's say, caprices. So initially, the film was supposed to be produced by Art Ving Thalberg, who was one of the big faces of MGM. So Thalberg wanted his wife, Norma Shearer, I'm probably butchering her name, uh, so he wanted her to play the role of Lizzie, and he wanted Clark Gable, aka Red Butler, as Mr. Darcy. 
So obviously that never happened because Thalberg died in 1936, so the movie was put on hold. So the project got on track only in 1939, but Clark Gable left the movie mainly because he started in Gone with the Wind. He hated the movie and he didn't want to do yet another costume picture, you know, what we call a period drama today. So you need to understand that Clark Gable hated, as I said, working in Gone with the Wind even if it's his best known picture today, mainly because costume pictures were considered to be women's pictures and therefore they were so material and nothing really serious. So Norma Shearer abandoned the project pretty quickly, so obviously they had to find replacement for both. So Vivian Lee was interested by the role and you know, she was British, she meant success because she had just played Scarlett O'Hara. So, she was actually a very good option, and she wanted Lawrence Oliver in the role of Mr. Darcy. So the new producer, Hans Stromberg, he liked Oliver too, but there was a problem. So Vivian Lee and Lawrence Oliver were having an affair, and they were both married at the time. So, of course, MGM didn't want to get into trouble and have to handle them, even if they later got divorced from the first spouses and got married. So. They kept Lawrence Oliver, and they went for Greer Garson as Lizzie, who was a British actress Oliver had mentored in the past in certain plays he was directing. So filming the movie, it wasn't that easy because there were a few British actors on set, and keep in mind that even if they were filming in what they called a women's picture, they couldn't film in London as they wanted because of World War II, so obviously people were worried, and Greer Garson had even moved to the US precisely because of World War II. But according to Anne Rutherford, who played Lydia, the hardest part for all the actresses was to pretend they were virgins. This said, a common misconception that in old Hollywood times, female representation was abysmal and way worse than it is today, you know, I'll have to disagree. You know, a strange side effect to the sexual revolution in the 60s is that female characters in film actually became dumber, while romances became very male-centered and that the male gaze became more dominant than ever. Don't believe me? Let me give a concrete example. So one big genre that in that time was the screwball comedy, and Pride and Prejudice can easily be adapted into that kind of film. So big stars of the screwball comedies were actresses like Barbara Stanwyck, Claudette Colbert, uh, Carol Lombard, um, Ginger Rogers, Katherine Hepburn, you know, they all played ladies who were quite smart and witty and didn't take any shit from anyone. I mean, actually, can, can you just imagine Katherine Hepburn playing a ditz? And to give an example that's closer to us, Han and Leia from the Star Wars original trilogy are basically a screwball comedy in space. And Carrie Fisher herself, who was the daughter of debut singing in the rain, Reynolds, by the way, she compared the overall dynamic of Han and Leia to Howard Hanks, who's pretty much the father of screwball comedies, and that Han and Leia are basically roles that could have been played by Humphrey Bogart, Gary Cooper, Lauren Bacall, Barbara Stanwyck. And since this was at the time of the Hays Code, so... Basically, the thing was that directors and screenwriters had to find tons of ways to put in sexual subtext and innu innuendo. And one of those ways, believe it or not, was to make the female characters a lot smarter than they can be in a lot of movies nowadays, and they were even the driving forces in the story. So, Lizzie in Pride and Prejudice is the driving force of the novel, and even the smartest person in the story, even if she makes mistakes of her own. So for the 1940 adaptation of the movie with Greer Garson and Lawrence Oliver, Lizzie is, without the shadow of a doubt, the driving force in the film. But come to think of it, most of the action is done by the female characters, and I mean, sure, the basic plot points of Darcy finding Lydia and Wickham and making sure they get married is still there, but again, it's mostly the female characters who drive the plot, and you got Lizzie, of course, who is front and center, but you also have matchmaker Mrs. Bennet. And one interesting departure from the original story is that Lady Catherine de Burr is the one who finally brings Lizzie and Darcy together. And there's a reason for this, of course. So 
Edna May Oliver, who played Lady Catherine, she was basically typecast by MGM as this stern old lady who, nevertheless, was a benevol has a benevolent side to her. So, the dialogue about marrying Darcy between Lizzie and Lady Catherine is essentially the same. But instead of being an, an attempt from Lady Catherine to intimidate and humiliate Lizzie, it's actually a test of character in which she threatens she will disinherit Darcy if Lizzie marries him, you know. Basically to make sure Lizzie isn't a gold digger or something of the kind. And again, it's a change that, you know, either you like it, either you hate it. I personally liked it. Maybe I'm just super optimistic, but who knows. And you know, overall, all of the male characters, they just really feel secondary compare, compared to female characters. You even kind of feel bad for Darcy, because even if Lawrence Oliver is perfect casting considering the actress active at the time, and even if he's pretty stuck up and haughty with Liz's family at the beginning of the movie, you know, he just tries so hard to be nice with Lizzie and to smile at her while making small talk, and he's just such an awkward dork about it. You know, first awkward nerd Darcy was Lawrence Oliver, kids. Never forget that. And it's just so well done that even if you feel sorry for Mr. Darcy at times, Lizzie is never unlikable about it no matter what. Because obviously this is a Jane Austen novel, and we're in the 1940s, before second wave feminism. So you do feel that despite it all, the Bennet girls all have this element of vulnerability about them, in the sense that they know that if they don't get married, their lives won't be easy. And everything is still very much rooted in reality, just like how Austen's novels were rooted in what she knew. And I've seen people complaining that the actress's interpretation of the Bennett girls is somewhat too modern. But I have to say it didn't really bother me, mainly because I kind of have that criticism about Keira Knightley's Lizzie in 2005 film. It's not that I don't like Kira's take, I love it, but it does come off as a bit too modern at times. I'll elaborate more on that in part two. So yeah, the Bennett sisters do come off as a lot sassier than in the, in the novel, but since it fits with the screwball comedy genre, I don't really mind it. So the screenplay was written by Jane Murphy, yes, a female screenwriter, yay, and Aldous Huxley. Yes, that all just Huxley. This said, we know that most of it came from Jane Murphy. Aldous Huxley was kind of hired to make sure the film felt British enough. And Huxley himself didn't like working on film that much, mainly because he felt he was being paid for not doing much. But, you know, get Aldous Huxley on a Pride and Prejudice movie and you'll get shit like Mr. Bennett telling Mrs. Bennett as consolation drowning one of their daughters at birth would have helped them a bit. This said, this film still feels American on certain aspects. I'd say this film is a lot more family-centered, while Austin novel are a lot more marriage-centered. Basically, Austin's ultimate goal is to be married, while the film presents the ultimate goal as to having a family. So yeah, you may think it's pretty much the same thing, but there's a difference. So because of that really subtle difference, the Bennett family feels a lot more tight-knit than in the novel. And there's also the fact that in the novel, both Lizzie and Darcy are gentry. Mr. Bennett is a gentleman farmer, while Darcy is a gentleman as well, and even though they're technically in the same social class, Darcy is closer to aristocracy than the Bennets are. So in the movie, the Bennets are middle class, while Darcy is a gentleman. So because of that, there's also a very American criticism of the British class system that also comes in. And that wasn't in the original novel. So Lady Catherine playing matchmaker is kind of a representation of the gentry accepting the middle class's rise in society and even approving of it. The screenplay is based on a play by Helen Jerome more than on the Jane Austen novel, so obviously the story is a lot more condensed in the play as well as in the movie, so there's no Maria Lucas, there's no Mr. and Mrs. Hurst, no Colonel Foster, and the gardeners and Georgiana are only mentioned and never seen since there's no journey to Pemberley either. 
So there are no officers, so Denny and Wickham are just Meriton inhabitants. So because of the Hayes Code, again, Mr. Collins can be a clergyman, so you can make fun of religion in movies. So because of that, he becomes Lady Catherine's librarian. And because the plot is tighter, um, the character development we see with both Lizzie and Darcy in the novel is a lot, I'm gonna say, faster. Because if you read the novel, you know, Lizzie all of a sudden realizing she was in love with Mr. Darcy all along after refusing his marriage proposal not so long before is acceptable enough because you can s we get to see her train of thought. And if you haven't, well, it comes off as pretty sudden in the movie, and I kind of blame the pacing and the fact that the studio forced the film to be shorter than what the director wanted it to be. So, ah oh well. Anyway, to get into the more visual stuff really quickly, if I can say it that way, you know, you have the costuming. And I have to admit it, it's one of the things that kind of made me weary at first about this film, even if I ended up really enjoying it. Because the costumes are all from the 1830s, 1840s, with the hoop skirts and everything. It's not Regency clothing at all. And that's what turned me off the movie at first, but there's a reason why they went for that wardrobe and rather than Regency dresses. Basically, the official reason they gave was that they thought Regency dresses were too plain and that 1860 dresses were a lot more costume porn worthy. So the truth was that at the time the adaptation was made, MGM was broke. So broke, they actually borrowed costumes that were used for Gone with the Wind for the film. And this is basically an extreme case of costume recycling. And costume recycling is actually something that happens a lot for period dramas. And honestly, it could be a podcast in itself. And there's also the fact that all the ladies are wearing 1940s makeup with dark lipstick and fake eyelashes. But keep in mind that since the movie was in black and white, well, they had to make sure the actors didn't look so pale. Especially that, at that time, Greg Garson was 36, so you had to make her look like 20-year-old Lizzie Bennet. It's actually kind of ironic, because, you know, when you think that everyone in this movie, I mean, they're all so pretty. Like, we get Shaw Lucas, who is referred to as plain as, at the beginning of the film, while the actress playing her is gorgeous. I mean... The ugliest girl in the movie is Mary Bennett, and sure, she has glasses, and she looks a bit dorky, and she has funny ex facial expressions at times, but she's adorable. But, eh, I mean, for me, worst offender when it comes to the good old Hollywood homely trope is Joan Fontaine as Jane Eyre. Plain, Quaker like Jane Eyre, played by Joan friggin' Fontaine. By the way, fun fact, Marsha Hunt, who played Mary Bennett, was actually a very good singer with perfect pitch. So to quote her, she had to learn to sing in the crack just between two tones. You know, just enough to hurt the ears. And by the way, I'll be putting a link in the description to an interview um, that was done in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it's with Marsha Hunt um, and Rutherford, who played Lydia, and Karen Morley, who played Charlotte simply because it is absolutely delightful and it really gives you a fascinating glimpse into what was movie making at the time. So now we move on to the next adaptation which is a 1980 BBC miniseries produced by Jonathan Powell for BBC, directed by Cyril Koch and with a screenplay by Faye Weldon. It stars Elizabeth Garvey as Elizabeth Bennet and David Rental as Mr. Darcy. I'm going to start, first of all, by saying this isn't the first adaptation of Pride and Prejudice the BBC did. So this is actually the fifth adaptation, and the 1938, 1952, and 1958 miniseries are considered to be lost, apart from one still from the 1952 version and a few pictures for the 1958 version. And one thing that makes me especially sad about the 1952 miniseries is that it's the one with Peter Cushing as Mr. Darcy. But sadly, today is not a day I talk about my very big crush on Peter Cushing, so 
that will be a topic for another day. As for the 1967 one, um, I did manage to find some clips here and there. Again, clips. Um, it seems like it's the only surviving material, um, so because of that, I'm not going to talk too much about it since, well, excuse the pun, I don't really have the full picture. So the first BBC adaptation we have in entirety is Darfur, the 1980 adaptation. Um, it does have its share of fans. Um, it's the Jane Austen Society's favorite adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, and that's mainly because it's the most faithful to the book and Faye Weldon wrote the script. Well, as for me, you know, I've kind of been peeking around and I can see that it's some people's favorite because, you know, of a sense of nostalgia and, you know, for them, Lizzie and Darcy are Elizabeth Garvey and David Rintel, while for others, it's Jennifer Ely and Colin Firth, and for others, it's Karen Knightley and Matthew McFadden, and for some people, it's Lily James and Sam Riley and a whole bunch of undead people, because why not? Who am I to judge? If the 1980 miniseries is your favorite, that's fine with me. I mean, I'm actually sorry about what I'm going to say. And you know, it's not that it's a bad adaptation. And look, I'm willing to forgive certain things because it does seem like they didn't have that big of a budget to make those miniseries. But it's just so boring. And it's boring in the sense that it just feels so British. And I mean, the 1995 miniseries are super British as well, but at least it's entertaining. The thing is that the 1980 miniseries is part of many BBC adaptations of classics in the late 70s and during the 80s. Um, I think pretty much every Jane Austen novel got adapted along with Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, Dracula, Oliver Twist, you know, you get the picture. Um, obviously BBC adapts classics regularly enough and it does it again every 20 years or so. So all the adaptations from the late 70s, early 80s represent one generation for me because they have one thing in common. They feel very theatrical. So the 1980 series, it has its moments, but sometimes it kind of looks like a high school play. Um, the screenplay is very close to the book, to the point it feels awkward at times. Um, I don't think there's a single line that in it that doesn't come directly or indirectly from the book, so because of that, third-person narration from the book becomes dialogue at times, and they get turned into inner monologues. And... It's very hit and miss, like 75% miss, 25% hit, and I'm being generous. Like, just the voiceovers. No. Make them stop. And I think the reason why I find this adaptation so boring is that I'm used to Pride and Prejudice being fun. Everything is taken so seriously. And there's not that irony that's so characteristic of Jane Austen's work. There's not this lightheartedness that makes the dramatic moments such as Lydia's elopement such a punch in the gut. And because of that whole atmosphere, it doesn't help with Lizzie's character. Elizabeth Garvey is decent, don't get me wrong, but she just really pales compared to the other Lizzie's. So, if you compare her to others, it doesn't help her at all because she looks like Fanny Price played by an actress who's actually trying to give Fanny some personality. Yeah, Mansfield Park probably has this coming, guys, but for the record, best thing I can say about Mansfield Park is that I don't dislike it. And as for David Rental as Darcy, again, if you like him, that's fine, but he looks constipated. There. I said it. This said, fun fact, he's Aerys Targaryen, aka the Mad King in Game of Thrones. That just feels so weird. However, his Darcy was actually adorable when he meets the gardeners with Lizzie at Pemberley, mainly because it's just so unexpected. You know, you see him smile, being polite and welcoming, and all you can say is, oh, he really can smile, give me more of that. But yeah, that's the only moment. After that, we're back to 
constipated Dorsey for the rest of the miniseries. Hmm. Also, random comment, but Sabina Franklin, who plays Jenna Bennett, is really pretty. Well, she's very different looking from Susanna Harker from the 1995 miniseries or Rosamund Pike. Mainly because, well, she's one of the rare chains who's brunette instead of blonde, but for some reason it just really worked with me. I can't really explain why. And then there's the Bennett. So, Mrs. Bennett in this version is not too bad and not as caricatured as in the other versions and the novel itself. And of course she's still very silly and foolish, but you can tell that well, she's well-meaning, and that she wants the best for her daughters, even if she has a clear tendency to put her foot in her mouth. But her family, especially Mr. Bennett, but also the girls as well, well, probably because of their father's example, they can be pretty mean and condescending to her at times. It's to the point, Mr. Bennett becomes plain unlikable, and you wonder why Liz even likes him. And Mary... Okay, this is me nitpicking at this point, but her playing the piano was just so over the top. Unfunny, because no one plays like that, and it just looks, again, over the top. And it just didn't work with the overall interpretation the actress went for. But this said, there are three saving graces. Lady Catherine is actually a lot younger than in other adaptations, and she's actually still pretty glamorous looking. And she was just... So charismatic. I mean, you can totally see why that lady is totally full of herself, and it just works. And it just works so well. Really, you, you see her, and you say, like, yeah, that's Mr. Darcy's aunt. So, Mr. Collins, in this adaptation, in my opinion, he's the closest Mr. Collins to Jane Austen's novel. I've seen a lot of people saying that David Bamber's Mr. Collins from 1995 miniseries is the closest to novel, and even if I like his interpretation a lot, I kind of have to disagree because he, he's not really slimy because Jane Austen describes him as a big guy who's kind of clumsy in his, in his eloquence and that's the Mr. Collins we got here to T. Also, I think this is the adaptation that fleshed out Anne de Verde most. You know, you can infer easily from novel that the reason why Anne is such a doormat and she has no personality is because of her mother's crushing charisma. And there's this really sweet little scene during Lizzie's last visit as, at Rosings where she takes Lizzie's hands in hers and smiles simply because Lizzie's the only person who stands up to her mother and she admires her for it. So, you know... That kind of thing makes me hope that, you know what, they actually became friends later on. So now onto the one you've all been waiting for, the 1995 miniseries produced by Sue Birdwithal. I'm probably butchering it too. So yeah, produced by Sue Birdwithal for BBC, directed by Simon Langton, and with a screenplay by the one and only Andrew Davies, starring Jennifer Ely as Lizzie, and of course, Colin Firth as Mr. Darcy. So, remember how I wasn't really big in 1980 min miniseries? Neither were Sue Birdwell and Andrew Davies. To the point, one day, they decided to make their own adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, and that would become the 1995 miniseries, which is easily the most beloved adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. Unless you're a fan of the 2005 film. Guys, guys, please, please don't star war in the comments, please. So, Andrew Davies is a big fan of the show Don't Tell approach. So, you can guess that just like me, the inner monologues in 1980 version drove him crazy. So basically, he has little scenes that aren't in the book, but that are there just to show what a character's personalities are, show their development. And he doesn't just do that with Lizzie and Darcy to show how their feelings for each other change, but also with the secondary characters. So each character has a personality of its own, and they just never feel bland or unnecessary. And what's also different from the previous adaptations is that the center of the story isn't just Lizzie anymore. 
Both Lizzie and Darcy are at the center of the story as dual protagonists. They're the ones who make the plot move forward, all culminating into the two of them meeting in the middle. And what also makes the miniseries seem so much bigger than previous adaptations is that it wants to be a look into Regency England, because that's what Jane Austen's novels were. You know, Jane Austen wrote about what she knew, and she knew exactly how to laugh about the little things she'd come across daily. You know, it's really worth reading about all those little aspects that were very typical of the Regency era, and that we won't notice at first glance in her novels. So when they met, made the sets, the costumes, everything, the idea was to do the research about Regency England, but they wanted it to look attractive to the modern audience nonetheless. So, the sets themselves talk about the characters' personalities, you know, for instance, colors at Longbourn and at Pemberley will be very bright, while colors at Lucas Lodge and Rosings will be deep because they want to show off that they're rich. You know, it also goes for the coaches, the way the characters occupy themselves, and so on and so forth. Show don't tell at its finest. And they also do the same with the costumes. You know, the Bennet sisters have printed dresses, as a contrast to the Bingley sisters, who never wear anything printed, but rather something that could be considered haute couture for the time. You know, it's all silk, they have big feathers in their hair, and Bingley is the one also who wears bright colors, while Darcy always wears something darker. So it continues with her hairstyle. So Susanna Harker was chosen to play Jane partly because she fits the Regency era's ideal of beauty, which is pretty much why most of the modern audience thinks Jennifer Ely is, as Lizzie is more attractive than Jane. You know, Jane pretty much looks like a Greek Roman sculpture, so her hairstyle was made to look what, like what Roman women used to wear. So Lizzie is styled the same way, except that while Jane is the classically pretty one, Lizzie is your brainy brunette, you know, so the curls kind of give her personality. So Lucy Briars, who plays Mary, you know, she was made ugly on purpose, you know, they gave her moles, glasses, she has funny facial expressions, and they made her hair look kind of greasy and made her ears stick out more. Um, and... There's Kitty, who's the one who tries to look elegant without too much effort either, and Lydia's hair is meant to look a bit messy. Again, the idea is to show who the characters are. So for me, even if technically the 1980 miniseries is the most faithful adaptation to Jane Austen's text, emphasis on text, for me the 1995 miniseries is the most faithful adaptation to novel spirit. You know... I just read the novel, and the 1995 miniseries just play in my mind. I just can't think of anything wrong about it. I love it just that much. And obviously, this is the adaptation that started the phenomenon famously known as Austin Mania. So for the kids who were there at the time, well, technically neither was I, since 1995 was literally the year I was born, Anyway, not only that adaptation started a long series of more BBC and other adaptations of Austen novels and other British classics, but this is how an entire generation of women started saying, I have high expectations in men because of Mr. Darcy. Because ladies, Colin Firth as Mr. Darcy is the shit. And you will enter my fangirl for the next five minutes. So Colin Firth basically took what was good about Lawrence Oliver's perf performance, multiplied it by a thousand, and he did it so well. He felt like Mr. Darcy had taken possession of his life, and he accepted to play Mark Darcy in Bridget Jones's diary in order to cleanse his soul from Mr. Darcy's ghost. You know, his Darcy can be summed up by, I'm an arrogant jerk who hates having to socialize because I'm terrible at it, and heaven forbid if anyone finds out. And you know, he falls in love with Lizzie, and his way of showing it is basically spending hours staring at her, looking like he wants to die because he knows he shouldn't be falling in love with her. And yet, he keeps staring at her, and he probably writes Mrs. Elizabeth Darcy in his diary at night in order to become disgusted at the mere sight of those words and cure himself. 
But when he starts dueling hearts and flowers around him, he knows he's screwed. So yeah, he does the Britishness, right? He's stoic, but he ain't a robot either. And you just genuinely go... You, you just genuinely want to say, Aw, you know when you see him as Pemberley being the best big brother ever, or see him smiling at his wedding, because it's really just that rewarding. And of course, this is the part where we have to talk about the lake scene. So you need to understand, this isn't just about giving some fan service to the ladies watching. You need to see it from a Regency perspective. You know, Darcy plunges in the lake to cleanse himself from all of his prejudice and due to his social standing and everything. He comes out soaking wet in his underwear, but for Regency standards, it's naked. And obviously, he has to come across Lizzie. And where was Lizzie before? Visiting Pemberley, you know. A lot of people accuse Lizzie that she's just materialistic and that she changed her mind about Darcy just because he's rich. I mean, she knew the guy had a 10,000 pounds a year income, so no. But remember what I said about houses reflecting our character's personality? Well, Lizzie sees that Pemberley is very well kept. She sees that the servants love Darcy and have nothing bad to say about him. You know, she sees later that his sister is honestly really sweet and that it's obvious that she adores her brother. Basically, everything Darcy said in his letter about Wickham and himself gets confirmed. She learns to see past her preconceived notions of him and she sees him for who he truly is in every sense of the word. And that includes him in his underwear. Get it? And while we're on the topic of wet shirts, let's talk about sexual subtext in the miniseries. Yup. So, the 1940 film played a bit with that aspect. So, keep in mind that this was during the Hays Code era, and screwball comedies, among many other genres, they liked to toe the line between what was permitted and what wasn't with subtext. So, 1980 miniseries was, you know, they were more prude than Lady Catherine Berg's underwear, so obviously, there's nothing much to say on that side. The 2005 film went all the way with subtext, you know, the kind of sexual subtext where the romantic leads face each other, panting in anger, leaning towards each other as if they're going to furiously make out and do the deed, before turning away pulling sighs of frustration from the audience. But we're going to leave that for part two. The 1995 miniseries basically strikes a perfect balance between putting all the sexual subtext you need without getting explicit or raunchy. And it's perfect. It really is. I mean, can Andrew Davies do an adaptation of Mansell Park, please? Obviously, when it comes to Lizzie and Darcy, there's the Wisher scene mentioned above. Um, there's Mr. Darcy awkwardly staring at Lizzie, but the miniseries is also careful to show that the whole thing doesn't limit itself to sexual attraction or Lizzie being interested in Darcy because he has a nice house. What makes them a real deal is how much their relationship stems from a sense of mutual respect. Lizzie comes to love Darcy because she sees he's genuinely a good person who cares about the people he loves and who would do anything for them. And Darcy respects Lizzie because she's a smart lady who speaks her mind, all the while having a kind heart and, you know, really being someone who cares for the people she loves as well. And actually, that's what attracts them to each other and makes them so compatible. Two smart people who make mistakes, but come to a point where they can see each other for who they are and are fiercely protective of the people close to them. Jay and Bingley, on the other hand, they're the classical beta couple of a rom-com. They're there to be the sweet, kind-hearted romance, and there's ultimately not much to say about them, apart from the fact everyone and their mother spends the movie rooting very hard for them because, well, they're just so nice and happy, and you just want them to be happy. Lydia and Wickham, on the other hand, that's when things become a bit sexier. For the best, and for the worst. 
So Lydia is, of course, that ditz who flirts with everyone and doesn't give a shit about consequences. Jane Austen is not very kind to her for the simple and good reason that the way she sees Lydia, it really seems like she 100% knew what she was doing. She knew how terrible loping would be for her family, and she saw it all as one big joke because, well, it's not that she doesn't see the consequences, she just doesn't care. And yes, it's very easy nowadays to say that, you know, it's Wickham who coaxed Lydia into eloping with him, but Austin infers using Lizzie's point of view that it was Lydia who insisted on leaving with Wicked. Now, while Lizzie can be a bit of an unreliable narrator, I mean, understatement of the century, there's nothing in the novel that indicates that Lizzie's thought here is wrong, and Lydia pretty much remains a ditzy jerk ass until the end. The 1995 miniseries doesn't really try to make Lydia more sympathetic. It actually doesn't shy away from showing that, yeah, Lydia and Wickham totally did the deed before getting married. I mean, duh. But we get things like the two of them staying in that shabby hotel room in London, not going out much, so you can guess what they were up to during those long days and nights together. You know, you have Wickham sitting there in his underwear where, while Lydia is all giggly, rolling around in a bed that hasn't been made in what looks like a nightgown. Oh, did I mention there's a single bed too? Seriously, you could put on a big sign with "Day Bound" written on it above their, their heads, and you wouldn't make it more obvious. And that's what makes them different from Jane and Bingley and Lizzie and Darcy. They're not together because they have things in common or because they have projects of their own that they have in common. Nope. They're together because they find each other attractive and they want to bang. Basically, people from the Regency era weren't that different from us. They just had more restrictions, basically. And that leads the audience to ask themselves questions that can go really deep, like, there's a whole marriage matter with Mr. and Mrs. Bennett, where it's implying Mr. Bennett married her because she was pretty, and when looks faded and he realized how stupid she was, it was way too late. The book, just like the miniseries, make point of showing that Lydia was basically Mrs. Bennett when she was younger. Minus the scandal, of course. So that kind of makes you realize you know, did Mr. Bennett rethink his life while he was searching for Lydia? Did he realize how terrible of a father he was because in an attempt to avoid a woman he came to scorn, he let his own daughter become like her? Did it make him reconsider who Mrs. Bennett was as a person or how he treated her? And honestly, it's, this is something I'd like to see develop. Not gonna lie. So... I don't know how to conclude this, mainly because there can't really be a conclusion to this, considering part two is to come with the Bollywood film, the 2005 film, and the Lizzie Bennet Diaries. Um, just so we're clear, um, I do not intend it to be the next episode because I'll be doing something more Halloween-related for October, so it will probably come out in November. So, in the meantime, stay tuned. So if you like this podcast, please like, comment, hit the subscribe button. I can also so be found on Twitter and Tumblr. I really need to get more active on those. All the links can be found in the description below. Um, if you can share this video, it would be very appreciated. In the meantime, thank you to all my lovely listeners and have a great day or evening or night, wherever you are.